Consciousness is a brain process. Uh, that's a much more plausible view than any of the alternatives, which say that consciousness is a spiritual process done by souls or, or by all sorts of ridiculous views that are around right now, such as panpsychism that says that consciousness is part of every human universe. But the only entities that we have reason to believe are conscious are, in fact, uh, organisms that have brains, not just humans, but I'm quite convinced that certainly, that certainly uh, uh, birds and mammals are conscious as well. Uh, so the only entities in the world that we know to be conscious are in fact entities with brains, and we've got an increasingly good idea about how the brains do that. So my theory of, of neural consciousness it's not the most popular one. There are a few others around that are more popular. But my theory is that it's also tied in with semantic pointers. So semantic pointers I talked about as being neural representations that get combined out of neural, other neural representations. They have this really interesting property that Chris Eliasmus was, I think, the first person to notice. That when you have a simple neural representation, it can be tied in with the sensory modalities that it came from. So for example, when you see red, there's neural firing that's actually caused in part by the reflection of the light off the red thing in the world. And so the pattern of firing is tied to that. What's cool about semantic pointers is that when you combine them into more complicated representations, you retain some of this connection to the sensory origins. So if you combine red with shirt, for example, so you have Shirt is an observation, it's a sensory representation. Red is a sensory representation. But now you get the more abstract con concept of a red shirt, you get a semantic pointer, but it's still got some connection with red and shirt. It's not a complete one, you, there's some loss of information there, but you still have the connections. So I argue in natural philosophy that this idea that you retain the modality, I call it modal retention, is a key part in understanding how it is that a neural mechanism, a neural representation, can be connected to these sensory origins. And so that's why you get different experiences. A key part of a neural theory of consciousness is you've got to explain, well, why do some things seem red? Why do other things seem loud? Why do other things uh, uh, involve pain? Well, all of these things are different kinds of neural processes because of these properties of semantic pointers that I call modal retention. Um, so that's a big part of it. You've got to have these representations that can hang on to aspects of the sensory experience that caused them in the first place. Well, that's part of it. But the other part of it that's really important is ideas of competition. So consciousness is very limited. You've got 86 billion neurons going on in your brain. And so that means you've got billions of neural groups operating in your brain at any given time. But almost all of that's unconscious. Why right now am I, unconscious, am I conscious of the computer screen in front of me? Well, because it's got my attention. But that could change really quickly. If a bird suddenly crashed on my window, my attention would leave you in the computer screen and would go right to the window to see if anything had happened there. So attention is competitive. But how does that work? Well, in my theory of consciousness, it's by competition between semantic pointers. So at any given time, you can have these billions of, of neural representations occurring, some of them are semantic pointers, which are more complicated representations formed by combinations. But these semantic pointers compete with each other to get access to consciousness. The consciousness is, has limitations because it can only happen through particular kinds of representations or in particular, particular parts of the brain, not just one place, but, but there's a number of different places where this kind of competition goes on. So the idea is, we're conscious and we have these different experiences as a result of competition among the semantic pointers, which are neural representations which carry forward the sensory experiences that help to form them. That's really interesting. So it's not then a like so it's not then just a matter of complexity. Like IIT, for example, just sees consciousness as a level of some level of complexity of integrated information. No, no, I don't, no, no, I think that's uh, the, the information integration technology is, well, it, it's got a bunch of problems. First of all, it doesn't have a coherent account of what information integration is. When I talk about informa information integration, I mean, you've got one neural representation, say for red, 
and a neural, another neural representation, say for shirt, and you integrate them together. And the semantic pointers show how that works. Information integration in Tononi's theory is a mathematical abstraction that is in fact computationally intractable because it requires computing all the subsets, uh, all, the, all the set of subsets, and that's an exponentially increasingly large number. So that's just simply computationally uh, incoherent in any real life situation. So no, I think that's that's a non-starter as a neural theory, even though that's probably the most popular neural theory right now. I think it's just a, a really bad theory, both for internal reasons and also external reasons, because it doesn't explain why there are all these different sensory experiences. So with my Sepanic pointer competition theory, I can explain why there are these different conscious experiences, why they get more and more complex, right up to the level of cringing, because semantic pointers get more and more complex because they get bound together into more complicated ones. So I haven't done this yet, but my aim is to have a theory of cringing that can handle all these things because the, the uh, information integration theory can't handle it. The other popular neural theory right now is uh, Stanislas de Haines broadcast theory, which actually I think is probably a component of what goes on, but it, it, it can't explain the difference in different kinds of conscious experiences either. He says, well, we don't deal with that, but that means he's got a bad theory of consciousness. So I think these are the, the three best neural theories of consciousness right now, and I think I can make a case that mine is the best. I actually do this in the consciousness chapter of my balance book, where I argue that you can integrate the useful aspects of information integration and consciousness broadcasting into my semantic pointer theory view into what I think is now the best theory. Is it the final theory? No. I, mean, we're, I think we're, we're sort of in the early stages of this in the same way that Galileo and Newton were just starting to figure out how physics works. So it's going to be hundreds of years before this is sorted out for a while. But I think there's, there's real progress now. And we certainly have reason to believe that this neural approach to consciousness is way better than the alternatives out there, such as dualism and idealism and panpsychism. Yeah, I mean, to a naturalist, those aren't even starters. Well, panpsychism is naturalistic. It's just a bad naturalistic theory. So panpsychism says, yeah, rocks are conscious, so that's okay. And, and eventually humans just get more of it. Well, I don't think that rocks are conscious <laughs> and trees aren't conscious either, but there are lots of organisms with neurons are that you can figure out how it works by figuring out how the neurons have these mechanisms that have consciousness as an emergent property. Do you think there's a bit of a disconnect between people like yourself who are creating a computationally plausible theory uh, versus looking for neural correlates, that there's a difference in approach right now? Well, neural correlates were a really important idea back in the 80s when brain scanning started because uh, so little was known about the brain. When I got into cognitive science in the late 70s, I was I, I looked at... Picture, I, I suppose the brain seemed completely irrelevant to anything that I was concerned about, such as high level thinking. But uh, that changed. And the first thing that changed it was better techniques for measuring what goes on in brains. So it used to be that to measure what goes on in brains, you have to do what uh, Walter Penfield did and open up the brain and stick electrodes in. They did it back in the 30s, but you can't do that all the time. Whereas once machines came available for scanning brains, then suddenly, vast amounts of information could be acquired. So that was a big, big step forward in, in, in the 80s. So suddenly more was knowing about. And that meshed very nicely with new, new neural network models. So at that point, it started to make sense to talk about, um, well, so, sorry, to go back to the brain scans. The brain scans naturally suggested look for neural correlates because you could say right now that person is afraid uh, we know by their facial expressions and their self-reports that they're afraid. And we can see that there's a lot of neurons firing in their amygdala. So the amygdala is a neural correlate. Field. That just was really good. But I think it's really sad that people still talk that way. Because once neural networks, I, the idea of computational neural networks developed, and especially once theoretical neuroscience took off over the last 20 years, we don't just have to think about the neural correlates. That's just a start. That's just an observation. We can explain the neural correlates by describing the neural mechanisms. Right. And that's what theoretical neuroscience does. That's what uh, Chris Eliasmus' approach and some other approaches in theoretical neuroscience, I think, are doing really well. We're describing the mechanisms that are responsible for the correlates. And on the other end, the philosophical end, do you think the, the hard problem or asking what it is like to be 
a bat. Um, do you think those are those are roadblocks right now? Well, they could provide a start because I don't want to give up on conscious experience. I, I, I criticize Dehain because he says, well, we, we don't do experiments. We, strike, so we wouldn't do experiments, we do broadcasting. And Tononi claims to be explaining experience, but he doesn't even begin to do it because he doesn't indicate how his mathematically intractable processes could generate different kinds of experiences. But I think to try to have a theory of consciousness doesn't explain experiences is like having a theory yeah. of just disease that doesn't explain why you get a fever. It's absolutely crucial to it. So we want to explain that. And we take it as a fact to be explained. The idea of the hard problem or what, is, what it's like is a way to argue that this can't be done. It's really a way of defending either dualism or some kind of, of uh, impossibility thesis. Uh, and I think that's wrong because we're making progress on it. I think there's a, there's a recent book uh, by a neuroscientist where he introduces a nice phrase, which I like, uh, the real problem of consciousness. The real problem of consciousness is to identify the mechanisms that are responsible for conscious experiences. Not just the neural correlates, correlates but the mechanisms that are responsible. And that's, that's happening now. I think I've made real progress, for example, in explaining the different conscious experiences that are involved with emotions or why you're happy or why you're sad. And I'm trying to work up to cringing. <laughs> so, but, that, the neuro, that, but this can be done. And once you've done that, then you've solved the real problem of consciousness. And the idea of, of what it's like drops out. I mean, that, that's, that's really kind of dumb if you think about it. There's not one thing that it's like to be conscious. There's many things. There are, are external sensations like a seeing and hearing. There's our, our internal sensations like our balance and our our pain and our heat. There's the hundreds of emotions I've already mentioned, and there's even the abstract things like talking about consciousness. Well, these are all real conscious experiences, and you need to have a theory that can explain all of them. It's not one thing that it's like, it's there's millions of things that it's like, and a conscious, a real solution to the problem of consciousness will explain all of them. And now I think that's coming into view. It's coming into view thanks to ideas like Semantic pointers and competition among neural representations. So I think it's really exciting. These these are all possibilities that uh, are going to take probably not decades, probably centuries to work out. But you can see, you can see, um, you can see who where where, where the growth is. Um, Emery Lakatosh was a philosopher of science who distinguished between degenerating research programs and progressive research programs. The the dual the dualist hard problem, what it's like, hasn't progressed at all in the last three decades. Whereas the research program that looks for neural mechanisms has been a wonderfully progressive research program, and I think will continue to be so. Yeah, I, I, I read about, you know, like you came up with the criteria for demarcation, right? Like what is plausible science and what isn't? And it was along those lines, things that, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but things that do actually make progress and the community of people who work on it can see that they make progress. Yeah, and there are other conditions that go into it as well, such as the ability to take into account uh, in increasing amounts of empirical evidence. But yeah, that's part of it. Uh, if you look at pseudosciences like astrology, it's no different than it was 2000 years ago. But if you look at astronomy, the advances have been astonishing. So I think the same thing operates here with these studies of consciousness. No progress at all in dualism, but dramatic progress in neural explanations of consciousness. I felt that a bit of cognitive science kind of progresses without dealing with the the question of consciousness. Um, do you think that's sort of a mistake? That well, no. Th there were two good reasons for that. I mean, first of all, any science when it starts out has to deal with the the simpler kinds of things. So, if you go back to cognitive science got started in the fifties. In the fifties, the dominant view in most of the world in psychology was behaviorism which basically said, forget about the mind, just look at behavior. This was disastrous and it couldn't even explain the behavior of rats, let alone the thoughts of human beings. So that got replaced in the 50s because developments in psychology and linguistics and in and computers provide different ways of explaining how the mind works. But then people set out to explain things that were, seemed a little bit simpler, such as uh, decision-making or making inferences or, or making memories. 
So I think it was completely legitimate in those early days. People didn't worry much about consciousness. Part of that was illegitimate because the behaviorists had made that studies like consciousness seem scientifically illegitimate. But some of it is just trying to deal initially with the more, more accessible phenomena. Um, so it took a while before it became both possible and desirable for psychologists to investigate consciousness. And the same problem was in neuroscience. Neuroscience was trying to figure out basic things like, well, what are the neural correlates of fear? They weren't in any position to start thinking about what conscious experiences are. What changed that really was Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. He's the one who made it respectable for the first time for neuroscientists to talk about consciousness and not seem like, uh, like they were just being wild speculators. So that was a good change. And so it took decades of developments in psychology and neuroscience for consciousness to become on the table. But really for the last 20 years or so, it has been on the table. And that's where some really useful ideas, some concerned with attention, some ideas with neural representation have become available. So it took a long time for consciousness to really come on the agenda, but it's certainly on the agenda now. There's lots of new work coming out all the time. And the prospects for dramatic progress on the real problem of consciousness are immense.